Well, welcome to our one-on-one -on -one plenary session for this afternoon. Uh, the world is going through a lot of change, as we've been discussing, and it's, it's natural to be wary of that change, uh, especially when you, don't, when you don't know where that change is going. And I remind people that not all change is necessarily good. Uh, there was a story of an Italian sea captain hundreds of years ago on this big galleon who called his men together, and he said, men, I got the good news, and I got the bad news. First, the good news. After three months at sea, we're going to have our first change of underwear. So all the men are really happy. Change of underwear after three months. He says, now, now the bad news. Luigi, you change with Enrico. Enrico, you change. <laughs> so change isn't necessarily something to look forward to. But uh, from time to time, a person may undergo change. And that's the case with the subject of our one-on-one -on -one discussion. He spent nearly 14 years heavily involved uh, with the global Islamist movement, his ulta, his Uttarir, the Party of Liberation, promoting the ide ideology of a united Muslim uh, network across the world ruled by Islamic law uh, and rejecting the intervention of uh, Western powers such as the United States. Now, his Uttarir was uh, significant and controversial uh, and as a movement was banned in many countries, including Egypt. And it was on a trip to that country where our guest was arrested and held for four years in prison. And it was while he was in jail in Egypt that he started to reflect on his personal politics and beliefs and he changed. And it was a change that led him to co-found and run Quilliam, a think tank in London which is aimed at countering extremism. Now, it's going to be fascinating over the next 45 minutes to uh, get his views on everything from the Islamist agenda, some groups that uh, are still promoting, uh, how the up uh, uprisings in the Arab world are shaping into this as well, and the driving forces behind extremism. So please welcome Majid Nawaz. Now, of course, the best opportunity is for everyone here uh, to have a chance to question you, as it's, uh, it's really everyone's conference. But I will kick off with a couple of questions, if I may. And I think it's important for our audience to understand the difference between Islam and Islamism. I think that's a great question to start with, Riz. Allow me to, if I may, begin by thanking the organizers, uh, Philip uh, Erzinger especially, for inviting me here. Um, and the Board of Benefactors. And uh, I've got to say, especially to the students, this has been, and I do many conferences and I speak across the world, this has been one of the or the best uh, organized conference I've been to. So well done to the organizers for this. <laughs> now, Riz, to your question, uh, it's, uh, it's great that you've started with this because it allows me to clarify something. Uh, there's a huge debate. Before we set up Quilliam, there were two main schools of thought around this subject. Uh, and they can be caricatured, and I say caricatured, forgive me for the generalization, but they can be caricatured as those who blamed terrorism, uh, blamed Islam itself as being responsible for terrorism, and the other school of thought, which are uh, those who blamed everything entirely on the West. And there are caricatures in terms of individuals who represent both of those schools of thought. Those who uh, want to say that the problem is with the faith of Islam itself and those who want to blame everything on Britain, America, and Europe. We came along and we tried to give a more nuanced perspective. And what we said was that no faith is responsible entirely for the world's problems. Faiths can be interpreted and have been interpreted in many ways. Islam, like Christianity, can be interpreted in a plethora of ways. Um, so we use the phrase Islamism. And what we mean by Islamism, to give a very one-sentence basic definition, Islamism is the desire to impose an interpretation of Islam over society by state law, using legislation. Islamists can be non-violent, and they can be violent, and they can be terrorists. But the ideology is the same, and that's the desire to impose an interpretation of Islam as state law over everybody else. And that's the crucial difference between Islam as a faith, which can mean anything to any Muslim, and Islamism, the modern political ideology. Islamism emerged in Egypt in 1928 with the creation of the Muslim Brotherhood, but there are many, many organizations and many schools of thought within the Islamist ideology. Like with communism, it's the same thing. Now, of course, um, irrespective of the differences you've cited there, for many people, particularly in the West, Muslims are scary people. How do we counter that stereotype? It's a hard one to shift. There is that stereotype, like there is in, say, uh, I also work in Pakistan, and there's a stereotype that Americans are scary people. And so we have to... <laughs> <laughs> we're so, we're, um, and we have to be... Uh, we have to... It's very difficult. But what I try and do is... Uh, and I spoke just... The, the, uh, before coming here, I spoke at Oxford University, and 
What I did there was focus on what people, the audience I was addressing, can do uh, to challenge these negative stereotypes themselves. When I go to Pakistan, I focus on what Pakistanis can do. So those two ingredients are crucial. What we can do in Europe, European Muslims, first of all, Muslims born and raised in Europe, they need to do more, frankly, to challenge extremism within their own communities. But they need to do it by doing it themselves, they will be the best evidence that the problem isn't simply because they're Muslims. Because you'll have Muslims coming forward to challenge extremism. So if I'm sitting here in front of you and saying, I'm someone who's a Muslim, albeit not devout, but I am a Muslim, and I'm challenging extremism and saying the problem isn't with Islam, but it's with Islamism, optically, that's a powerful message to those who may have a problem with Islam itself, because they see more and more Muslims doing that. As for non-Muslim European society, then there are issues they need to address as well. One of the things they need to address revolves around identity. Identity is crucial in this debate. It leads to many European born and raised Muslims moving towards extremism because they experience an identity crisis. But mainstream European society is also suffering from an identity crisis. What does it mean to be European in this modern globalized world? What does it mean to be German? What does it mean to be Dutch? We know, for example, uh, what it means to be American. You can be American Italian, you can be American Cuban, you can be American Muslim, you can be American Jewish. We know in Britain, increasingly these days, you can be British Pakistani, British Scots, British Welsh, British English. But in Germany, in Denmark, in Holland, this question is still being debated. Is Dutch, Danish, and, and German, are they ethnic terms? Do they denote ethnicity, or are they citizenships? And that identity crisis needs to be uh, resolved in Europe. Now, one thing, though, is um, there's a big problem with people generalizing uh, when it comes to Islam and describing, for example, the political and social uh, issues in the Arab world as primarily a Muslim uh, problem. And they blame religion for many issues that come up because of society and because of, uh, that, that may also exist in many non-Muslim countries. I mean, Islam certainly doesn't have a, a monopoly on dictators and, and hardline rulers. So I wonder how much, uh, with the work that Quilliam does, you actually try to counter these, these stereotypes where people use expressions such as the problem with the Muslim world. That's a huge, uh, and I'm really happy you asked that question, that's a huge problem, one of language. We've released a briefing paper, for example, addressing language. Uh, people uh, generalize and they call Egypt, for example, they would call it a Muslim country. Well, first of all, there are 20% uh, of Egyptians are Coptic Christians. Many people may not know that. To call Egypt a Muslim country actually uh, surrenders, no matter what our intent is, it surrenders the country to the Islamist agenda, which seeks to define Egypt by one identity alone, and that's the faith identity, and it's in this case, the faith of Islam. And what that can do is then spiral to a point where if Egypt's a Muslim country, well, it needs to be a better Muslim country. And the way to be a better Muslim country is to become an Islamic state. Actually, Egypt is, is um, a, a republic, and it's a republic for all Egyptians. And, and as the uprising has demonstrated, all of these Egyptians want to live together as Egyptian citizens. We, don't, uh, we can't have it both ways. We, we can't, on the one hand, complain that the EU is a Christian club and it should allow, for example, Turkey in or those who do complain. Um, and, and, and call for more citizenship in Europe, yet at the same time, very lazily, abandon that threshold, abandon that criteria when referring to Muslim-majority countries and lazily call them Muslim countries. Let me, let me touch, before I open it up, let me touch on your background because that's important to the discussion here. Uh, as I'd mentioned, you'd come from a position that was about building Islam as a political force. With uh, Hizb ul Tahrir, you were actually part of this group that wanted to see a Muslim network ruled by Muslim law. And I wonder what... what you know, you went through before that change. What was it you envisaged when it came to a Muslim world? What we envisaged, I helped found this organization in four countries. I was uh, uh, eventually blacklisted from, uh, from three countries for my work uh, in this organization. And then, as you mentioned, imprisoned in Egypt. What we envisaged was creating the equivalent of the Soviet Union for Muslims. So we had politicized the Muslim identity uh, and, and, and the best analogy I can give to help um, everyone here understand is the concept of the international proletariat, where you have a global community of workers who owe no allegiance to anyone but other workers in other countries, and it becomes their responsibility to overthrow the yoke of capitalism uh, by working in tandem with the workers or the proletariat across the world. That same idea of the international proletariat, we imposed on the... Muslim religious idea of Ummah, which means the global Muslim community. So we claimed that Muslims have no allegiance to Britain, to Germany, to Denmark, to Pakistan, to Saudi Arabia, to Egypt. They have no allegiance except to themselves. 
and that it's their responsibility to work to create an expansionist entity that only represents those Muslims on the global uh, arena. Now that may sound fanciful, but I can assure you we succeeded in recruiting people from the militaries across the world. I've personally met with people we recruited in the Pakistani army. They were, I met with them in the year 2000. They were discovered by General Musharraf and arrested in the year 2003. But this organization has actually attempted military coups. Um, in Egypt, where I was arrested, uh, there was a case in 1974 known as the Military Academy case, led by a member of this group. His name was Salah Sariya. And there was a very bloody attempt to take over in Egypt. And since then, the organization was squashed. And it was our responsibility to attempt to rev revive the organization in Egypt. Where was the turning point for you? Where was it your mind changed? Do you remember that moment where you thought, I can't go forward with this. This doesn't work for me. There were a number of turning points because it was a process. Uh, I, think, I think the first one was when, when we were in prison, Amnesty International began campaigning for our release because they took the, the view, which has some cre credibility to it, that no matter how extremist someone may be, if they're not a terrorist, then they shouldn't be imprisoned for their ideas. So they began campaigning for our release. And that was the first time in my life that people that I considered the enemy we had believed that the human rights organizations out there were the soft power tool for colonialism to colonize the minds of our people. So people that I considered my enemy began campaigning for my release, and, uh, and, and the heart softened, my heart softened when, when that campaign began. And then the second thing was the studies. I met with, in prison, I was uh, there with the assassins of the former president of Egypt, Sadat, who was killed in 81. They had abandoned their jihadist ideology. Um, jihadism, by the way, talking about definitions, jihadism is uh, the view that you need to use terrorism to bring about Islamism. So jihadism is not the same as jihad, just as Islamism is not the same as Islam. It's the politicization of jihad, as Islamism is the politicization of Islam. So I was in prison with former jihadists, and the discussions and debates that we had in prison also helped me change my mind. Eventually, when I left prison, it took me a roughly a year to tear myself away from this identity, and, and in May 2007, I declared my departure from the group. Interesting you mentioned jihad because uh, there is, and I've debated this on my show, you know, that uh, there is a misunderstanding of this word. It just means a personal struggle, but it's been, as you say, uh, politicized to yeah. become jihadism. Yeah, lingu anyone here knows Arabic. I mean, linguistically, jihad literally means struggle, um, but, and, and Islam means submission. But both of those uh, uh, phenomena have been politicized by those who have uh, imposed upon the modern uh, political concepts that uh, actually have their roots in post-World War I European fascism, and they've imposed them, them upon Islam uh, to create this modern ideology we call Islamism. So if you're giving up smoking, you have a jihad against smoking. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, All right, we're going to open it up and let's see if we have questions from uh, our, our audience because we have so many people in the studio. I'm going to try and get to the hands as I see them go up. It's a little dark, but I can see them. Gentlemen here, and then I see you at the back as well. We'll come to you afterwards. I'll try and get you in the order I see you, please. If we've got microphones, let's try and get that. So one here, and then if we can get one to the back, very back as well. In the meantime, I'll come to you. Three or four have gone up, so I'll try and get to them in order. And tell us who you are as well, please. Yeah. I'm Jalan. I come from India. We have a population of 150 million people, the second largest in the country. And yet, the Muslims live in great assimilation in this secular country. Is there a lesson for the world to learn from this? There is a lesson. Uh, I was commenting, uh, I was just having lunch actually with a lovely chap who's probably in the audience, Vijay, Vijay who's also from India. He's doing his MBA in Japan. So hello Vijay, wherever you are. Um, and I said something to him which, oh there he is. I'll, say, I, I'll repeat it here, which is that I've, I went to the Indian themed dinner yesterday. I met many Indians at the dinner. The musician was also a British Indian. I don't know if there are any Pakistanis here. I'm yet to meet any. Anyone? Raise your hands. Right, so no one's raised their hand. So I'm probably the only Pakistani here. I'm British Pakistani, um, proud of my dual nationality. And what does it tell you? That the Indians are here as business delegates, business leaders, uh, musicians and performers, and the one Pakistani in the, in, in the, in the entire conference is here to speak about terrorism. I, I'm half Pakistani, if that yeah. helps. <laughs> <laughs> And what does it tell you? What does it tell you that the other only half Pakistani here is to interview the other Pakistani about terrorism? <laughs> so we've got a real problem. Now, I, I say this seriously because bin Laden's just been found in Pakistan. Um, and, and there is a real problem. Now, you, you allow me to actually introduce something which I'm, didn't come out in the questions, but I'm very, very keen to speak about. As well as founding Quilliam in 
in, in the UK as the world's first hub to challenge extremism and challenge the narrative in public. We are essentially doing the counter-propaganda against the extremist narrative across the world. We've also founded a movement in Pakistan called Khudi. Now, I know uh, the members of that movement will be watching this interview. Khudi is Pakistan's first counter-extremism youth-led social movement that we've been working on the ground for the last three years to create this platform. And essentially, Khudi works to challenge extremism on the ground with young, educated Pakistanis, inoculate them against the extremist message, and to create buy-in for the democratic culture. Because what we need in Pakistan is to rebrand democracy to make it trendy once more for young people to be Democrats. Currently, it's not trendy. Currently, to be a Democrat in Pakistan is to literally, it's a swear word. It's to be a, a tool of colonialism. So what we're working very hard to create is a rebranding of democratic culture in Pakistan. We currently have around 35,000 online followers on Facebook. On our platform on Facebook, we have around 3,000 volunteers across the country and around eight full-time activists working around the clock to make this movement Khudi a success. And for you, uh, for my fellow sort of uh, Indian friends and cousins here in the audience, I would encourage you to get in touch with me because one of our themes is peace in South Asia. And I think if we can genuinely create demand for peace on the ground in countries like Pakistan and India, then we'll have a more prosperous South Asia, we'll have a better developed South Asia, it'll be good for business, good for our own psychologies, it'll be good for everything. Um, but this is one of the challenges we face, and I'm talking, this challenge I'm talking is a 10 to 20 year to 50 year challenge. It's not something we're going to fix overnight, but it does require serious work. Okay. Let's try and get to these questions. There's one gentleman right at the back there, yeah, the, the hand that's at the back there, if we get a microphone, please. My name's Andrew Radin, I'm from MIT. Uh, I wanted to, I, I like the fact that you made this distinction between Islam and Islamism, but I want to talk to you more about uh, Islam, Islamism and variations thereof. I guess is there any um, middle ground of incorporating some aspects of Islam into governance uh, that w the West can accept or, or not fight in, uh, in Afghanistan, for example? I mean, it's the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. Is, is that ultimately unacceptable or, or where is the line drawn? Okay, again, a great question. Uh, for those of you uh, who don't know, uh, Islamism as an ideology has its violent manifestations, like in the form of Al-Qaeda. It has its revolutionary manifestations, like the group that I used to belong to, where we would try and instigate the armies against the governments. And we didn't believe in participating in elections, but we also didn't believe in terrorism. And it also has its political manifestations, those groups that try and use the ballot box to come to power. Um, so like with communism, you have the socialists, the Trotskyites, the Leninists, the Stalinists, you know, all these varieties under the umbrella of one ideology. And that's what Islamism has too. So to the question, I think Egypt as a case study is something that's going to be increasingly significant in the coming years because we have the, the, the largest, the most organized, and I say organized, not necessarily the most popular, the most organized opposition group in Egypt are the Muslim Brotherhood. They are essentially an Islamist organization. They believe in ruling by an interpretation of Islam, yet they are not terrorists. They're not terrorists. So uh, applying your question to a very real case scenario, what can be done about that situation? Well, first of all, I'd say the Muslim Brotherhood is not a monolithic organization. There are competing strands of thought within this organization. I was uh, in prison with the current global leader of the organization, Mohammed Badia. I was also in prison with the leading reformers who are within this group and in prison with those who defected from the group and tried to reform from the outside. So all of these nuances exist. Um, and I think what the international community needs to do, and I use the phrase international community and not the West, because again, part of it is the narrative and we have to get the narrative correct. Uh, who intervened in Libya? It was the international community, not the West. The UN is an international body. Um, and the international community's response to countries like Egypt should be to encourage a type of situation that arises uh, that we see in Turkey, where we've moved to a post-Islamist phase. Uh, the Turkish government uh, is still a religiously centric government. It's still Muslim-centric in its outlook, pretty much like Christian Democrats. Uh, but they no longer believe in imposing one version of Islam over society, or that's what they say at least. And if we can encourage the Brotherhood to transition in that way, but I, I would say with a caveat, just because I know there are more questions, that that shouldn't be the end. We mustn't be satisfied with that. There's absolutely nothing to say that Muslim-majority societies cannot be liberal democracies. There's nothing to say that they cannot be liberal democracies. And I'd say that the most popular desire of the people in those countries is for liberal democracy. Young man over here. 
You got the microphone there? Come to you in a second, yeah. Hi, I'm Niklas Heusch, economic student from Germany. Um, I was fascinated by your point about identity or identity crises. Um, it seems to me we like to think that terrorists or suicide bombers are from underprivileged backgrounds where they have little else to do and then someone says and someone comes along and says, hey, wouldn't you like to be a suicide bomber? And because they have nothing better to do, they say yes. But if we look at it, they are usually middle class, they are educated, and they are the kind of people we think should lead happy lives and watch flat screen TV. So it seems um, identity or identity crises um, are very important. So I was wondering if you could comment on what German society could do or what European societies, Danish and Dutch, could do to help these people um, get over the identity crises and what a European version of, of hoodie um, would look like. Well, uh, again, uh, I'm really impressed by the questions that are coming here today, and, and you've hit the nail on the head. In fact, statistically, the proportion of highly educated terrorists and highly educated Islamists, not necessarily all Islamists are terrorists, statistically, the proportion of those who are highly educated is higher than those who are university educated uh, on average in America. And that, that was actually uh, discovered by Mark Sageman in his book, Leaderless Jihad. He had a sample study of 500 jihadists. He found that, on average, they were better educated than the average American. Um, and, and anecdotally, we can demonstrate that. Bin Laden is an engineer. His deputy, Zawahiri, is a pediatrician. The man accused of masterminding 9-11, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, is an engineer. The man accused of killing Daniel Pearl in Karachi, Omar Sheikh, was a graduate of the LSE, where I did my master's. Or at least he studied there. I don't know if he graduated. I did, at least. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and this anecdotally, you can demonstrate it across the board. Uh, Hizb al-Tahrir grew in the UK across some of the best universities um, in the world. And uh, the headquarters of Jamaat Islami in Pakistan is Punjab University. So you're perfectly correct. And identity comes at the core of this. Now, what Europe can do better on this identity question is we really need to solve this question about what it means to be European, what it means to be German, Danish, Dutch, Spanish, Italian, Greek. I was in Greece, for example. 10% of, 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 of the population in Greece are ethnically Albanian. Uh, increasingly, they are born and raised in Greece, and they are denied Greek citizenship because they haven't solved the question as to what it means to be Greek. Is Greek an ethnicity, or is it a citizenship? Now, labels like British and American are the way forward, but countries within Europe haven't necessarily, they don't necessarily have those labels because for them, Greek, Dutch, Danish, they still imply the ethnicity. And unless we solve this question, uh, we won't be able to create a home for those Muslims born and raised in those countries who feel European, have no other country, but are not accepted as European. Now, I must emphasize it is a two-way street. The Islamists have been spouting out propaganda for a long time, as I did for 13 or so years, that you cannot be British if you're a Muslim. You cannot be German. You cannot be Dutch. You must only be Muslim and work for the caliphate. That's their propaganda. But surely it's not mainstream societies. But surely it's not mainstream society's job to, to reinforce that propaganda. And that's where we need to, to solve the, the, the problem. Okay. There's a young lady waiting patiently there. We've got the microphone there, and I'll get to the others. There was a couple more hands. I'll, I'll get to you in just a second. Yeah, just waiting for the microphone. Okay. We'll come to you in a second. Uh, thank this, you. This young lady's first, yeah? Uh, my name is Shalaka Patel. Oh. My question is that there are some organizations that are viewed as... Um, oh, I'm sorry, is there someone else? The microphone's floating around. Go, go ahead first. Okay. Um, there are some organizations that are clearly viewed as uh, terrorist organizations, and then there are some others that are comparatively moderate. And um, I was wondering what the comparatively moderate organizations like, say, the Muslim Brotherhood, etc., have viewed as the role of women in, uh, in this, and especially the evolving role as... Um, I mean, as times move yeah. ahead, I was wondering if you could comment on okay, that. Okay, so before, before the, the Arab Spring, there were two approaches to foreign policy. One was to support the dictators uh, and to view the dictators as the defense against the rise of extremism. And, the, and that was generally the right-wing view. And the left-wing view, generally, again, <coughs> forgive the generalizations here. We don't have much time. Um, the the left-wing view generally was to try and empower those that they recognized were the most popular um, opposition groups such as the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. I think the Arab Spring has disproven this model. I think the Arab Spring has demonstrated, first of all, uh, that there's no false dichotomy here. It's not either dictatorship or extremists or Islamists. 
I think it's also the Arab Spring has, has, has demonstrated that the Muslim Brotherhood, though they were the most organized in Egypt, they were certainly not the most popular. The most popular narrative coming out of the Arab Spring and the Egypt uprising was the democratic narrative. Um, now, of course, post-uprising, the most organized group, the Muslim Brotherhood, will be able to capitalize on that far better than the, un or than the disorganized populist young Democrats. So they may appear as, they, as if they have more popular support, but actually um, what was I interesting with the uprising was that it completely bypassed the Muslim Brotherhood, caught them completely off guard, caught them unawares. So we need to re realign our policies in, in, as the international community, I suppose, to look to countries like Egypt and see how we can help the young Egyptians who did organize along democratic lines represent their voice in a better way in organized political blocs. I hope that answers your question. There was a question at the front here. Yeah, this young lady has yeah. a question, and we'll come over there. Um, yeah. What sort of support do you and your organization have among majority Muslim communities, um, but also Muslim communities within European societies? I mean, your organization has previously been accused of being part of a elite counterterrorism expert sort of industry that has emerged recently and rather disconnected from the real needs that certain Muslim, Muslims have in European societies because of this heavy focus you place on counterterrorism. That's another great question. In, in Pakistan, we're working in the grassroots, and as I said, we have about 35,000 online followers. We have about 3,000 volunteers across the country. I've personally toured 24 universities in Quetta, Balochistan, in interior Sindh, in the deserts, in Peshawar, and I've spoken to audiences as large as this of Pakistani students. To, uh, to help present alternatives to the Islamist narrative. So there we're working on the grassroots. In Europe and in America, we're working as, um, as a policy advisor organization. We're not working to create a grassroots. And that's simply because um, we, needed to, we needed to work very quickly with the mistakes uh, that had occurred in policy. Don't forget, we, s we established Quilliam in the heyday of neoconservatism when Bush was still in office. And we needed to work very quickly with governments to correct a lot of the mistakes that were coming out from governments in those days, the American and the, and the British governments. And so that was our primary focus. But I like the idea that's come from the corner here, that I also think that Europe needs a grassroots uh, organization. But crucially, uh, uh, coming back to the theme of identity, it mustn't be organized along exclusively Muslim identity lines because uh, you're a female, I take it, I assume, and forgive me if I'm wrong, you're a Muslim, uh, but you also happen to be, from the sound of your accent, maybe you're Australian, I don't know, yeah? Wow, three out of three. Um, <laughs> so, so you have more than one identity. That's called you know. profiling, by the yeah. way. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing will stop you at the airport. Um, <laughs> by the way, for the record, Quilliam opposes profiling at airports. Uh, there's no such thing as what a Muslim looks like. So Muslims don't look like anything, um, as Adam Gadan, the spokesman for Al-Qaeda for the English language, will demonstrate. But back to this point here, um, the, 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 the European grassroots organization mustn't organize along exclusively Muslim identity lines because everyone has more than one identity. I'm British Pakistani, I'm Muslim, I'm a man, I'm a father to a son, a very proud father. Everyone has more than one identity and we need to embrace that in the modern globalized world rather than challenge that and, and end up be doing exactly what the Islamists have been trying to do for so long. There was a, a young lady who has the microphone already, I think, there, there you go. Hello, uh, my question is building up on the women issue that was mentioned earlier. Uh, this is Ipek Cem from Istanbul, Turkey. And I wanted to build up on the women's issue. One, about the role of women in these Islamist organizations. Of course, it differs from organization to organization and country to country. And the second, you mentioned Turkey. And the way that we've, we've come along, uh, I think, further than some of the other countries is also by empowering our women. So I wanted to find out what are your communications, how, how does your communication with the women in those societies about becoming integrated into the life of the society? How does that work out? Thank you. Okay. Can I just ask, are you also Australian Lebanese? <laughs> All right, there's four out of four there for you. So that's another identity. <laughs> um, but to your question on, uh, <laughs> to your qu but my best friend in London is Australian Lebanese. Um, to your question on, uh, on women, the leader of Khudi, the national coordinator, because uh, though I'm founder, I'm not obviously you know, on the ground there. 
I'm, I'm trying to do a lot of work in a lot of different ways in different countries. So the leader of Khudi in Pakistan, the national coordinator, is a woman. And I did that deliberately. It happens to be... See, that's how shocked he is. Um, <laughs> drops his glass. But I, I did that. We wanted to do that on purpose because uh, I, I wholeheartedly agree. So important to this struggle is involving women. But I, I also disagree with a certain way of doing it. The way I disagree with it is... I don't believe in positive discrimination. Uh, and I don't believe that, that, that women's issues must only be dealt with by women, and Muslim issues must only be dealt with by Muslims. This type of pigeonholing is, someone's clapping, there's only one person. Your family here. Yeah. <laughs> this type of pigeonholing is, I think, unhelpful and counterproductive. Um, I think terrorism isn't a Muslim issue, as we've been discussing, it involves everyone. Uh, the identity question is something that touches on all of society in Europe. Um, you know, Switzerland, for example, with a minaret ban. Um, uh, and that, so much of that revolves around identity, and, the, and mainstream Swiss society is grappling with this question of identity as well. So uh, women's issues are, uh, I, I, men should be just as passionate about women's issues as women. That's what I'm trying to say. Though, uh, of course, the national co coordinator for Khudi, she is a woman, her name's Fatima, and we're very proud to have her there. Now, I'm going to try to get to the hands in the order that went up. There was a couple at the back there, I didn't see the order, but perhaps we could take that, that lady there who's got her hand up first, because those two have been going up patiently. Oh, are those hands in the corner there as well? Okay. And I know there's a few at the front here, so we'll try and get to as many as we can. I'd see what happens. Hello, uh, my name is Helena Ratner, and I'm from Copenhagen Business School. And I don't know what a Danish identity is, and I'm glad that you don't know either. Um, <laughs> I just have a, a few months ago in Denmark, there, were, there was a bit of a public debate about his career because the Royal Library uh, gave space for one of the leaders to have a public debate there. Now the context in Denmark is we are very liberal in regards to the freedom of association and also the freedom of, of speech. As most of you know, we published a few cartoons some, a while ago and uh, that, that evoked a, a big debate. Uh, and, the que and we also have neo-Nazis marching once a year in Denmark. And the question is, of course, also whether what the debate that was spurred by the Hitzbud Taria's uh, public speech was whether Denmark should allow for... for anti-democratic associations to speak in the public. I mean, what is the litmus, litmus test of democracy? Can it encompass anti-democratic forces, and should it? And could the public debate sort of regulate that? What do you think of, what do you think uh, the status of such associations should be in the public? Okay. First of all, uh, allow me to apologize to your nation. I helped co-found Hizbut Tahrir in Denmark. I actually founded the Danish-Pakistani branch of Hizbut Tahrir in Denmark in the year 2000. So accept my apologies for that, because I think they're the most extreme branch of the group in Europe. Uh, you, you have quite a problem with HT in Denmark, um, HT being the acronym for Hizb tahrir On the question of banning, we've advised very, uh, uh, I suppose, uh, frequently, we've advised the British government on this question. I personally advised David Cameron on this question uh, before his Munich speech. And we've constantly been against banning Hizb tahrir in European and Western societies, like America um, or Australia. And the reason, and they're active in Australia too, by the way, uh, the reason is because uh, they're not a terrorist organization. They are an extremist organization. And the analogy is like in the UK, we have the BNP, the British National Party, which is a racist political party, but it's not a, at least in its constitution, it's not committed to violence. Though some of their members may become violent, it's not the party policy to be violent. And I think as liberal societies, we need to understand two elements. I testified to this in the US Senate in 2008 in Senator Lieberman's committee. I'm very proud to say that governments have increasingly adopted this criteria, including the UK government, and, uh, and the Conservative Party is currently debating this issue at the moment. The two areas are this, legal tolerance and civil tolerance. The law must tolerate extreme yet non-terrorist views and organizations, like racism and like Islam Islamism. But civil society must not tolerate the same. And to, to, to work through the example, uh, the BNP are legal, the British National Party are legal in the UK, so the law tolerates them, but they are a taboo to be associated with in civil society. You wouldn't want your best friend to be a racist. You wouldn't want your best friend to be a homophobe. And you wouldn't want your best friend to be an anti-Semite. We need to get Islamism, non-violent Islamism, to that stage where it's legal to be an Islamist, to espouse views such as women cannot rule or be heads of state, 
to espouse views such as uh, people that commit adultery must be stoned to death. These views, because they're not terrorist in essence, they're essentially involving the rights and, and, and law and how law should change. Uh, they must remain legal, but you wouldn't want your best friend to be somebody who advocates stoning to death. And so it's about turning Islamism into a taboo. And sadly, in the 90s in the UK, it wasn't there. But increasingly so, with the work of Quilliam and others in, in, in across Europe, Islamism is slowly becoming a taboo. Where groups like Hizb tahrir uh, maybe should be banned are in those countries where they're actively trying to overthrow democratically elected regimes via military coups. Because that is in violation of international law and the domestic law of those countries. Two cases come to mind. Hizb tahrir has an official policy to overthrow uh, the democratically elected regime not just the government, but the entire regime in Turkey. And the second one, the example, is Pakistan. In both these two countries, they are actively working to infiltrate the army and overthrow the regime. Uh, and, and that's illegal. So there's an argument there for banning them, but not in countries like in Europe where, where they're doing nothing but proselytizing. There they must be challenged, debated, um, and, and made into a taboo. Okay, only time for a couple more. I'm, um, forgive me, I'm going to get to them in the order I, I was trying to get to them. The gentleman in the shadows who had his hand up. I didn't realize that was... I thought you were just showing me the other uh, microphone, but yeah, please. I am Venkatesh from India, studying in the University of Delhi. Uh, any religion which, is, uh, which has to be in line with modern time has to have a lot of reform movements to be in touch with the modern times. For example, Hinduism in India has undergone a lot of reform movements in spite of a lot of orthodox practices. Similarly, is there any possible for a spiritual reform movement in Islam which, could, which will go beyond socioeconomic conditions? In that situation, uh, from where could it come from? Okay, so the, the question was about whether um, there, sh there are reform movements within Islam. I assume you mean by that theological reform movements. And the answer is yes, they are. Now, I'm not a theological leader, and I don't pronounce on theology. And the reason I don't is because there are two stages we have to deal with here. And the same, by the way, happened with Christianity. Um, uh, the Reformation and Martin Luther's attempts to break away from the Catholic Church was decoupling state and power and politics from Catholicism or from religion. But Martin Luther was still a religious believer. Martin Luther was still somebody who uh, was devout. And in many, many people would define him as a fundamentalist. You know, he, he killed many peasants. So there's a, there's a separate stage, which is reforming the religion from within, which is different and distinct from decoupling it from politics. My role and Quilliam's work and Khudi's work is not to be a religious platform. We are a secular platform. Our purpose is to decouple those who desire to impose one version of Islam over society, Islamists, from the faith itself. Once we've done that, or even alongside that effort, a separate challenge is to reform the interpretation of religion as a religion. And there are people doing that. In Pakistan, Javed Ghamadi is a classic example, someone, who, someone who's well known and is doing that work and is fantastic at doing that work. In Britain, my good friend Osama Hassan is another person who's doing that work and is great at doing that work. They are leading the theological debate. We're leading the debate against Islamism or the politicization of Islam. One very last quick question. This young lady here was patiently waiting as well. Forgive me, I know we're so short on time with this debate. Hello, my name is Annabel Hillenbrandt and I study at Humboldt University, uh, Humboldt University Berlin. And may I ask a quick personal question? I guess when you separated from your group, there were some kind of reactions on that. So weren't you afraid of that? And after your complete change of mind, what gave you the strength to do it? And in what did you believe? Yeah, I, I, I've, been in, uh, I've been in a peculiar position where I've been attacked physically, punched in the face uh, by Muslims outside of mosques uh, when I was a young 16, 17-year-old activist for HT because they were offended that I was overly politicizing their faith. Um, and now fast forward to uh, almost 15 years later, when we're trying to depoliticize it, I've been punched and attacked by people offended by the fact we're trying to secularize the faith. Um, that uh, actually indicates two things. One, how the debate shifted to a point where the default form of expression became Islamism among angry young Muslims. That's worrying, but we will turn it around, I promise you, because there are people out there, there's a whole organization now out there in Pakistan, and there are institutions like ours and others in the West, and their job is to turn this around. But personally, um, of course, it's a very difficult task, and that's one of the reasons why more people aren't doing this job. It's challenging on a psychological level because I had to uh, recalibrate my entire identity after leaving that group, my entire social circle. 
I was married into the organization. I'm no longer married. Um, so it had very, very severe personal uh, implications. And that's, I suppose, one of the barriers to former Islamists actually coming out and doing this work in public, because it is socially challenging. Of course, then there's the security aspect of it as well. Um, people are very, very uh, worried about putting their lives on the line to do this sort of work. Most people that do this are, are assassinated uh, in countries like Pakistan. I'm hosting, um, this Thursday, I'm hosting the daughter um, of the assassinated governor of Punjab. Salman Taseer was, was killed by his own bodyguard for challenging this type of extremism. His daughter Sherbano is coming to London. I'm organizing a dinner for her. But that's a very real example of the type of uh, sacrifice people have to make who are doing this work. Quick question. How do you find it going through airports nowadays? Yeah. <laughs> that's actually uh, interesting because I'm at the forefront of... of uh, we've trained the Department for Homeland Security in America. We've trained... Uh, I, I met and consulted to Secretary Chertoff when he was, uh, when he was there as Secretary of Homeland Security um, under the Bush administration. Um, and now, you know, I'm in touch with him even after that. And we've actually rolled out training sessions for, uh, for the agents in Homeland Security. And despite that, every time I go to America, I'm selected for a random secondary search. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's got so common now that, the, uh, that, that I have to sit there, I tell them, actually, they say, what do you do? And I say, well, I train uh, your ICE agents, the Immigration Customs Enforcement, on counter-extremism. And, uh, and, and so uh, I suppose, but the thing is, in my case, I suppose there's a bit of a justification. I was on the blacklist. I was actually banned from entering America um, because of my past. Because I, I, I was born in Yemen. I have a British passport, Pakistani last name, and just about every Arab stamp in my passport. Yeah. So I hear the latex gloves snapping when I walk in yeah. to immigration. Yeah. So yeah. presumably you get free health checks like I do. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Well, just, just I, I, as a Pakistani to Pakistani, perhaps I can share a joke with you. Yeah. Because there's a few jokes you can tell about Pakistanis. Um, <laughs> Now, the story of, of two Pakistanis who, who died at the same time and ended up uh, going up to heaven and finding there was a line outside the gates to heaven. And uh, one was a bus driver from Karachi, and one was uh, a mullah, a religious man from Islamabad. So there was a line, and there was the angel check checking everyone on the clipboard, you know, their names, their professions, where they're from. So the bus driver was before the, uh, the mullah, and the bus driver got up there, and the angel said, what's your name, your profession, where do you live, you know, where did you live? He said, I'm, a, I'm Imran Siddiqui, I'm a bus driver from uh, Karachi. He looks through, he says, bus driver, Imran Siddiqui, Karachi. Yeah, come on in. And the gate's open and he goes in. So the mullah puffs himself up and he says, and you? He says, I am uh, Kamran Ahmed. I'm a man of God from Islamabad. He says, mullah, Kamran Ahmed, Islam no, you're not on this list. I'm sorry, you can't come in. So he says, what do you mean? You don't let me in. I'm a man of God and this guy is a bus driver. You let him in? He said, well, and the business guys here will relate to this. We're very performance focused now, you know, uh, target orientated in heaven. And as it is, while you, were, uh, while you were preaching, everyone was sleeping. While he was driving, everyone was praying. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a big warm thank you to Majid Nawaz for joining us here. Thank you.